Hello, everyone. Welcome to the UCLA Brain Sport Podcast. I am with Susanna Rossi. She is an adjunct professor at UCSF and a principal investigator at Alto Labs. Altos Labs. Yes. Altos Labs. Yes. Sorry. Plural. Plural. Yeah, yes. Altos Labs. And you have been doing research with NASA for 14 years. Correct. Investigating the effects of space travel on the brain. Correct. Using rodent models. And you just told me that you think my in- my research is interesting. So that means a lot coming <laughs> from you. <laughs> so thank you for coming on. I think that um, this conversation that we're going to have, which it's basically how space travel affects the brain is incredibly applicable, especially in the direction that space travel is going, right? So yeah. not only is space travel headed in a direction where we're going to going to be going to deep space potentially, right? We're going to be taking trips to Mars, right? Correct. So that that's indicative of long-term space travel, right? Correct. So understanding how, how space travel affects the brain is really important in that context, right? We don't want to send our best and brightest, right, on Earth, yeah. put them through space travel, and they're not our best and brightest on Mars when we need them to be the yes. best and brightest, right? That is correct. So that's, that's why I think that's important. And then also... Space travel is becoming available not only to the best and brightest, but also to the general public, right? Yeah. This space tourism is emerging, yeah. right? There's a hotel on the International Space Station for anyone willing to pay. I don't know what that price tag is, but I can't afford it. But nonetheless, right, this is going to become available to other people. We need to understand how it affects people systemically, but also in the most vital organ in the body, the brain. Correct. Right? Yes. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, Why don't you just talk about a little bit of the research that you're doing in regards to space travel in the brain, and then we can go from there. Yeah. Well, I wanted to add uh, one more aspect that you might, I mean, space travel is the Probably one of the most, uh, the biggest achievement of humankind, right? Agreed. And yes. uh, we have seen even the excitement uh, since 1969, just in the past few months, when actually commercial uh, flights started to go outside of the earth, right? right. And, and so now everybody can foresee that as something that can happen. Yeah. And so it's becoming more and more prominent. But the other aspect, so, so the goal of, of uh, space medicine, I would say, right, to, to study the, the, the body in space, are two, really. One is to safely uh, bring uh, astronauts outside of the the low Earth orbit, which means outside of the ISS, Mm -hmm. to the moon. That's the first step uh, in the next couple of years. And then to Mars and then back. Mm -hmm. And so there are different steps here, right? We have not been outside of the low orbit uh, in uh, of the low Earth orbit in many, many years. And we have no much data. The data that we have are really from the ISS. And let me interrupt you yes. there from what, what I saw is a lot of our guidelines, not our, but a lot of the guidelines and the recommendations, for example, based off of r- radiation exposure, right? Yes. Recommended radiation exposure and how to combat that, that is based off of the experience of astronauts in the lower orbit, Correct. right? Which is completely different than outer orbit, right? Where you're yes. beyond the lower orbit International Space Station. Yes, because uh, basically in the Earth, we are uh, protected by the uh, magnetosphere. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, this is falling now. <laughs> yeah. We are protected by the magnetosphere. So all the deep space radiation does not enter in the Earth. So we are nobody, no, no, we're nowhere exposed to what you will find once you pass the Van Halen belt. Right. The magnetosphere is what? Something that surrounds, that's outside of the lower orbit that right. protects us that from protects the radiation. That protects from the radiation. Okay. And one step back, what mm-hmm. is radiation? Radiation is really those high energy particles and protons that uh, comes from explosion of supernovas right. in the Milky Way. And okay. so they're still fluctuating in the deep space. So people, our astronauts, are getting hit by exploding supernovas from no. other places in the space? Those exploded thousands of years ago. Right, but they're, they're, but they they're, get, they're, they're getting the radiation Correct. from exploding supernovas that happened thousands of, thousands years, of years ago, in a, in somewhere else in space. That yes. is primarily that, what radiation is. Right. So the radiation is composed of galactic cosmic ray and solar energy particles. Mm -hmm. So GCR and Mm SCP event. And the galactic cosmic ray are formed actually around 85 to 90 percent of protons, Mm -hmm. around 8 to 10 percent of helium and 1 percent of heavy uh, high energy particles. Those high energy particles are... 
for instance, iron, titanium, oxygen, those mm -hmm. very high energy that uh, have this, that is called linear energy transfer. It is very, very um, high mm -hmm. and energizing and transverse the cell all the way through right. in a way that is completely different from the gamma ray or X-ray that we experience on Earth. Right. So there is nothing that we uh, can uh, experience on Earth to that level, right? And those sources of radiation are present outside of the lower orbit. Correct. Right. Right? Those They're are, not present inside the lower orbit because of that magnetosphere. That protects us. Right. So if you were to plan a trip to Mars, uh, you have to consider that as soon as you exit the uh, the low orbit, right? Or the, or actually, as soon as you cross the Van Halen belts, uh, you are exposed to those radiation that are highly penetrant. There, there is no shielding. Mm -hmm. And a trip to Mars uh, will last around 18 months. Uh, the whole mission is around three years because it's 18 months to get there, mm -hmm. around seven months of ground uh, um, experiment and then come back. Mm -hmm. Now, also, Mars has not a very good uh, magnetosphere, actually has no magnetosphere. And so there is some mm -hmm. shielding just by being on the surface of a planet. If you think about something that is mm -hmm. bombarding you, right, as compared to when you are on deep space, it can come from everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you are on the surface of a space, it, it, you can still get some shielding, but it's absolutely nothing compared right. to Earth. So, so now you're looking at a very um, high exposure throughout the mission. Now, let me um, go back to that source of radiation that happens in deep space. You said it's energizing, yes. right? Yes. And then it also is, from what I read, it's significantly penetrating, right? Correct. Which means, you know, it does it, the the penetration into the body is significantly more than any sort of radiation you would experience on Earth, on or, Earth or within that lower orbit space. Correct. Right? Yes. Yes. Which is going to be a big deal, probably for a lot of the central nervous system effects that it might have. Absolutely. Right. And so, um, and to that extent, so we don't have any. While we have many astronauts that have gone uh, through the ISS, we have a lot of data on uh, absence of gravity mm -hmm. as one of the stressors that you encounter to go into a long uh, intra planetary mission. Mm -hmm. um, there are actually three three major stressors that mm -hmm. you that you have to that we have to face to help astronauts. One is the uh, deep space radiation, which mm -hmm. are not present in the ISS. Right. Absence of gravity or microgravity, which right. actually induce loss of muscle and bone density right. uh, to the rate of even one percent a month, and right. is pretty significant. And the other is social isolation and distance from Earth. In mm -hmm. the ISS, you have immediate communication to Earth. Is really there is no uh, social isolation. But if you foresee a, a three years mission, the farthest you go from Earth, the, the dif more difficult became the communication with Earth. Mm -hmm. And so you are now left with like four people that they have to get along together, and they may not even be able to connect with Earth. Mm. And they are social confined right. in, a, in a small space and far from uh, from right. Earth. And right. so those are all psychological stress add to physical stressor, add to the radiation. Now, these are all things, these three things are all things that can affect the brain and the central nervous system. Absolutely. Right? As well as other parts of the body, but they can also affect the yes, brain. Yes, yes. Right? Which is w what we're here kind of to talk yes. about, because I'm sure we could go down a rabbit hole of any organ system, yes, right? Yes, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the like, brain is, uh, but the is, brain is, is the most important. It's the most but, important. But, but I think we're a little bit biased. But, we are yeah, biased. It is what it is. Um, I tell everybody, it's like, we are who we are because of the brain. Right, right. Absolutely. So... Um, let's start with radiation. What, yes. are the, what are the effects of deep space travel radiation on the brain? So we don't have much data in humans because, as I said, we have no many missions that have gone outside of the lower Earth orbit. Right. What we can do is that we can use analogs on Earth to recreate those uh, high energy uh, particles uh, and expose rodents, which is our favorite uh, animal models, right, to see what happened. And so that's the best of the assumption that we have been able to do so far. Mm -hmm. And so in the United States, there is only one place where you can, uh, where there are accelerators um, that can recreate uh, um, the kind of particles that you can find in space, which is Brookhaven National Laboratory in Long Island, New York. Mm -hmm. And so usually NASA investigators, they send uh, those the, those the rodents there and the physicists prepare all those cocktails, various cocktails that initially when I started were always one, one ion at a time to okay. study like what does iron irradiation do to the brain at mm -hmm. the doses that uh, you would uh, be exposed into space. And to give you a, diff a little idea, I told you how galactic cosmic rays is formed by protons, uh, helium, and heavy ion. Mm -hmm. And it's calculated that uh, each cell of an astronaut in space will be transversed by a proton one, once every three days, mm -hmm. by helium once every three weeks, and by an heavy ion 
once every three months. Mm. So in a three years mission, uh, you can calculate that many cells of the brain will be transversed by the, the, th- those right. particles. And particularly when we think about the, uh, some parts that are particularly cre- key, which is the hippocampus, for instance, 13% of the neurons are calculated that could be affected uh, in the, in the hippocampus by these uh, uh, radiation, radiation particles. Radiation, yes. This is a quote that I got from a review back in uh, that uh, was put out in 2020 by Honorado and colleagues. Um, and they state that the observations from ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter in, indicate that a six-month mission to Mars would imply a radiation dose equal to 60% of the limit which is recommended for the full career of an astronaut. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, pretty significant. Much. That is significant, right? yes. That's almost, if you do a trip to Mars, you're like halfway to retirement as an astronaut based yes. off of the amount of radiation that you've received. Yes. So right. the question is, in fact, uh, uh, first of all, can you get there uh, and make a decision, right? right? And also, can you come back? Right. And once you come back, uh, how are you going to, to be, right? What right. are the long-term effects? Because right. those are uh, long-term effects. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you mentioned the hippocampus, yeah. right? That potentially is particularly susceptible yes. to the radiation. Yes. And the reason that the hippocampus is very important for, for people out there that might not be familiar with the yes. hippocampus, right? It is involved in memory consolidation, all sorts of memory yeah. and your ability to interact in space, spatial awareness. That's and even, uh, even uh, social memory. Social memory, all, social all kinds of memory, right? Yes. So yes. I think memory is pretty important. Well, if we, you're an astronaut, you know. I think uh, for everybody, we are for made everybody. of mem- we are made of memories, right? right? right. But for an astronauts and to uh, work at full extent to remember uh, everything, uh, memory is pretty essential. Right. And um, and so we have seen uh, by using different uh, uh, ions exposure and uh, exposing the mice to those to those ions, um, we have seen that there are uh, prevalent uh, deficits in uh, recognition memory and spatial memory, different forms of memories. Mm-hmm. And those uh, last long time, long, last many months, uh, that in mice, months are really years. Right. And so it's, it's of concern. And, uh, and interestingly, we have seen that uh, at least on those specific tests uh, that male mice seem to be more susceptible while right. female are not susceptible. But right. those are some of the outcome measure, right? There are many outcome right. measures that needs to be considered. So are you advocating for more women astronauts? Well, there are already more women astronauts, well, as we, we know. Need, we need more maybe based off of that. <laughs> yes, actually, yeah. there is also the idea. I mean, there is still uh, out there um, this three years mission to Mars, right? right? Do we put uh, like only female? Mm-hmm. Male and female spouses, like you know, sig- with significant other. Um, why? Why, is up why, to are you, why are you saying that? Like, why do you think that um, you're expecting some funny business in space? No, it's, it's, I mean, three I, years. It's three years. It's a long time. I, I'm, I'm living like that, right. right? But it's a long time. It's a real issue. I it think, is a real right? issue. That, like, you right. can't just ignore because it's you know exactly. it's off-putting maybe, but exactly. like it's something that you need to consider, yeah. especially when it's coming when you're talking about like. Uh, like the psychological effects of Absolutely. isolation, right? Absolutely. For example, Absolutely. So that I, I don't, they have not uh, come to a conclusion yet, but there is the idea like maybe only female if they're more resilient, but maybe, but I, I, I wouldn't support uh, couples because couples? No. <laughs> if you fight, right. whether you, well, you go for true. a walk on space. Right. 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 <laughs> Get out of my house. Take a space so walk. It's, it's a complicated <laughs> issue. Yeah. But for sure, for us, biologically, it was very exciting to uh, to find those, those discoveries, right? Those sex differences right. that are in line with many other uh, findings on different uh, injury models to right. the brain. Right. So then, you know, I've, I've noticed that uh, there's an extrapolation of data for um, for what would happen to people's cognition in space, um, and they extrapolate data of... Uh, atomic bomb victims that have been significantly yeah. radiated. Yeah. They extrapolate data from people that have brain tumors that are getting radiated. Yes. Um, do you think that you know we're able to do that? I know in the atomic bomb victims, they saw obviously cognitive deficits, yeah. right? And then also um, a lot of you know psychological issues, but they had just survived an, an atomic bomb exactly. exposure. So how much is it from the actual radiation versus the experience, you know? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a gross approximation. Yeah. And uh, and perhaps what we can get from the rodent study could help better to create a better approximation of, 
for what would happen in, to cells and right. tissues into sp in the space right. than not those uh, uh, epidemiological studies yeah. on, on bomb survivors. Yeah, is it pretty immediate the cognitive deficits that the rats that the mice get after no. they get irradiated, or is there some time of you know relative normalcy and then down the line? It's down yeah. the line. It's down if the you, line. If you test them around two weeks after, there are no deficits, but uh, starting 45 days to one month, three months, two, two months, three months, etc. Um, they they start to develop those deficits and they are persistent as far as they're we have persistent measured. through their through at least uh, one year later. Yeah. Um, so so the animals have been irradiated usually are six seven months old to the equivalent of an astronaut's. That is usually the, the the average age for an astronaut for the first mission is forty seven years old. Okay. Which is relatively older, right, right. Uh, because of all the training, right. and so the mice have been uh, irradiated basically as adult, uh, not uh, as young mice, and uh, and then following them one year later really puts them into what will be the equivalent of sixty five years old, sixty five to seventy years old uh, okay. uh, human beings. So so it's pretty uh, long time. So what are you thinking that that translates to in the context of human astronauts? Are you thinking that? Hey, we might have some issues during space travel, like when they get there, their they, their cognition might not be a hundred percent. Or are we worried about when they get back? Is this going to predispose them to Alzheimer's disease or some sort of dementia? I think both. Yeah, I think both. Um, the predisposition to dementia, I, I think, there is strong possible evidence. Mm. And actually, there, has, uh, there are other studies on, um, co from colleagues that have irradiated uh, you know, animal models for Alzheimer's disease, uh, and they've seen uh, that irradiation exacerbate an, an Alzheimer phenotype, for right. instance. Right. Um, so the immediate question is really how much it will affect the, the immediate uh, uh, action of the, that the astronauts, the executive function of the astronauts as well, while they are doing their mission, yeah. and how bad it is, and how can we... Um, uh, uh, mitigate. Yeah. And while we can't really shield uh, because uh, there is currently there is no way to shield those radiation, we really need to find a way to mitigate. There's no way to shield the radiation, the spacesuit, the haptic feedback suit, nothing no. can no, be No, especially able to... if they are out for a spacewalk uh, mm -hmm. or an EVA, which is not a spacewalk, but uh, an extravehicular activity, yeah. um, they are exposed. Okay, but what about inside the shuttle, inside there is the vehicle? Still, uh, there is still, they're still exposed. They're still, like, they're just receiving radiation yes. just the entire 18 months. Yeah. I also saw something that was pretty cool, that there might be a genetic predisposition to the uh, consequences of radiation to the brain. Right, where it's like maybe certain genetics might predispose people to have, you know, these cognitive deficits or some sort of consequences of the actual radiation. Yeah. Are you aware of that? Uh, well, as again, this is all animal studies because right. we don't right, have right, human yeah. studies. And what we know, yes, the animal study with Alzheimer's disease mice, mice that have a predisposition to develop Alzheimer's disease, like okay. ApoE4, so a genetic right, right. predisposition, right, right. they do have an exacerbated, they, they, they develop de deficits uh, more than a, a normal mouse. Yeah. And so, so these... Uh, this theoretically is easy to address because you can do like you can screen astronauts not only like physically but right. also genetically, genetically. right? But it, there probably there are many other genes that we don't know because of cancer, right? We don't exactly. know which which genes, which combination of the genes right. um, cause cancer. And do so, the astronauts currently get a genetic a genetic testing as part of their screening to become astronauts? I think for the APOE, probably yes. That makes sense. I would, I would imagine because that is readily available now. Yeah. Now, do you think that there's certainly probably other genetic markers that would predispose someone to radiation injury to the brain that maybe we haven't identified? Uh, absolutely. You think so? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. And, and it, I think one thing also that we are trying to work are those when just in studying those difference between male and female in the rodents uh, to pinpoint to, ta to genes that are different in the male and female and start to understand if those could be the genes, the genes that could cause those differences. I think you mentioned that there's a potential intervention. Yes, right? yes. Uh, what we found was, uh, because the lab is, is focused, our, our, our lab is, is focused on studying the inflammatory cells on the brain, uh, which mm. are microglial cells, right. which are those that uh, really are patrolling constantly the brain and making sure that everything works well. And as soon as there is something that doesn't work well, they intervene. So they're constantly active. And we have seen it after uh, radiation, those microglial cells uh, became 
irritated, if you wish, mm. right? Um, but only in the male mice and not in the female. Right. And, and we know from other studies that uh, those microglial cells have a different uh, uh, predisposition or signature uh, in male versus female. Mm -hmm. Where in female seems to be more in a protective state and in male it seems to be in a more inflammatory state. Right. And so we, we, we uh, question whether if we could reset that inflammatory states of the male brain mm -hmm. and uh, we could prevent those loss of cognitive deficits. And so what we did, uh, we irradiate the mice uh, with space radiation, got them back, uh, and then uh, treat them briefly with an intervention that uh, depletes microglial cell in the brain, very briefly kills all the microglial cell, which we think they are like, you know, the culprit of the long-term neuronal deficits mm -hmm. or cognitive deficits that are caused by neuronal deficits. Right. So we very briefly, we deplete those microglial cell and then uh, um, the mice are completely fine. And we wait three, four months later. And, uh, and then when we test them, and they are completely fine. They're right. basically uh, resetting uh, the immune system of the brain uh, is after uh, the irradiation, which is important after the irradiation, because if you do before, I mean, would be a different question. Um, resetting the immune system after irradiation is able to prevent the long-term deficits observed in male. Right. And uh, those compounds, we used one, but there are several now in clinical trials for mm. other conditions that are not CNS-related. Uh, uh, they are like mostly arthritis or peripheral uh, inflammatory disease-related. That involve inflammatory cell activation. Correct. So just to break that down, like to summarize all yes. that, you said some great stuff. So you notice that mice that get irradiated with the same kind of or similar kind of irradiation that astronauts receive or would receive in deep space travel yes. causes them to have significant cognitive deficits yep. only in the male mice. Yes. And these male mice, and you noted that via a bunch of different testing that tests, you know, visual, spatial, and memory, yes. right? And then you also noticed that um, then these microglia, yes. right, which are the inflammatory cell of the brain, yes. right, are activated only in the male mice that also only after irradiation have these sort of cognitive deficits, Correct. right? And then what you did, you gave them a intervention, a compound, yes. right, that deactivates the microglia after they get irradiated, right? It actually kills those cells. Destroys, destroys the microglia. Destroys them. And then uh, once you destroy those cells, they naturally repopulate in the brain. And they want to repopulate in the brain, uh, they are like just new babies. They're, They're new completely babies. nice right. and, and not uh, right. inflamed. And with that intervention, you notice that the mice, the male mice that got irradiated yes. do not have any cognitive deficits Correct. after irradiation. Correct. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. I wonder what um, completely depleting microglia in the brain would do, though. Is that what you're doing? You're depleting microglia in the brain? Yes. Or is it like a chemo treatment where you're depleting all immune cells throughout the body? No, no, no. Microglia? It's not a chemo, a chemo treatment. Okay. It's, it's more selective for microglia in the brain. Okay. And and actually, there has been, it has been used, we have used also with different kind of injury. Mm. And uh, it does, because it's a brief period, it does not do much to the brain. Right. So that implies that you think that this injury that's happening secondary to the radiation that you would get in deep space yes. is secondary to this microglial Correct. inflammatory yes. response, yes. right? Yes, because uh, we see like, uh, you know, the, the neurons, how do they communicate to form new memories? They form synapses right. that are the little contacts among neurons, mm -hmm. and that's how they form a memory. Right. And, uh, and after the radiation, after a long time, um, after the radiation, neurons lose those uh, synapses, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, uh, there is a strong correlation between the presence of those synapses inside of the microglial cell because they engulf those synapses, mm. and um, and the loss of those synapses. But if that's why they are also microglial cells are, are a culprit, right? That uh, right. they engulf right. those synapses, and so if the microglia are well behaving, then the neurons are happy and uh, and the brain is is healthy. So, what about the effect of reactive oxidative species? That develop does the, does the reactive oxidative species um, does that develop from the microglial ir irritation or activation or is that di directly from the irradiation received by the by um, 
by deep space travel? The, initially, the first response is really the reactive oxygen species that form as a, as a response to the radiation, the irradiation. Right. And then microglia became activated as in response to okay. that. That's really the reason why they get uh, right. they became activated microglia in response I, to the I, reactive yeah, oxygen species. I just species. wonder what the reactive oxygen species by itself, what kind of damage that is doing to the synapses or to the neurons. You know? That's that will be the initial, uh, really kind of almost mechanical in, insult uh, to the to the brain. Once those particles transverse the right. neurons, right, that they break, they break mm -hmm. those, uh, um, and so that's the initial uh, the, that's the initial injury. What you're talking about, right, right, which then activate a cascade of event uh, that is self-sustaining, yeah. unfortunately, yeah, and does yeah. not resolve. Uh, and uh, and then brings to the neuroinflammation uh, and right. chronic neuroinflammation right. and uh, persistent uh, loss of synapses. Yeah, I mean that's that's incredible, right? Because when you think about, it's not just one injury exposure that you're getting if you're an astronaut, right? It's like yes. you are constantly being exposed to this over 18 months. Yes, and right? in fact, you bring another caveat to the, to the animal studies that have been done so far, where it, precisely the brain is constantly bombarded, whereas the, the mice studies, what we have done mostly have been one one bombing on the brain, uh, if you can call one uh, one. No time. pun intended by that, right? <laughs> We, what we have done is a uh, one-time uh, irradiation exposure, right? But the brain, to the dose uh, that is calculated to be uh, over three years. And so, okay. so to complement this, very recently, some studies have started to actually fractionate that dose over a month period, right. where mice get irradiated very little every day right. with that cocktail. Right. It's a very, very time-consuming experiment, right. if you can imagine. Um, and so, but so far... Really, the first results are coming out now, but they show very similar effect to a single bolus. Okay. Uh, but I think more has to be done precisely for that reason, because the animal studies have done with one bolus of exposure to radiation right. to the dose that the astronauts will be exposed over three years mission. Right. And with your intervention, with wiping out the microglia Absolutely. and letting them grow, right? Absolutely. But that would have to be taken all, the whole time. That's a good question because we don't know. We would like to figure out if, on a second, if now the repopulated microglia is uh, uh, more resilient to a second insult or not. Right. And, uh, and how many times more, let's say, you will need to take it. Yeah.